In class, we had talked about how ecological communities are interconnected and how uh, loss or gain of different species can affect entire ecosystems and communities. We talked about the Yellowstone National Park and how uh, it is a diverse ecosystem. And we talked about how the wolves had been lost in Yellowstone National Park after the uh, 1920s. And we talked about how that might affect the different uh, organisms in the park and also how it might affect the rivers. So you wrote out predictions for what you thought would happen after bringing wolves back to the Yellowstone National Park. So now we're going to watch a video and then you can write out what, how your answers might change or maybe remain the same after watching the video. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, 
there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So now take a minute, pause this video and write out what you think happened to each of these different parts of the ecosystem after the reintroduction of wolves and list at least one of the things that changed with the entire ecosystem as a result of wolf e reintroduction and compare your notes after watching the video with what you had predicted. So what did we see? How would wolf reintroduction affect elk populations? We saw that the wolf reintroduction decreased the population size of elk because without the wolves there had been nothing to hunt elk and their populations had become too large. It also affected elk behaviors. So because wolves were now hunting elk, elk avoided the valleys where the rivers flowed and they were restricted to the mountain slopes. And this effect was very important, in fact more important than the reduction in their population size, which in itself was important, but the effect on their movement was significant because now the plants along the rivers could grow better. <coughs> What, how did the change in elk populations and behaviors affect the tree growth? We saw that because now the elk populations had reduced and they were now restricted to certain areas of the mountains and not so much in the valleys, the tree growth and the abundance of trees along the valleys, along the rivers increased and, the, and particularly trees like aspen and willow really increased in their size and abundance. This had a significant effect on beaver populations because beavers like to eat aspen. And with the increase in beaver populations, we saw more beaver dams along the rivers which caused more pools uh, along the rivers, increasing the number of fish and amphibians and birds along those rivers, also affecting otter populations which like to feed on the fish in the pools. So yeah, we saw the increase in beaver abundance led to more dams along the rivers causing more fish and frogs to thrive. So fish and frog populations increased. Now the increase, the change in elk populations also affected bison populations. Elk and bison both like to eat grass, though elk also like to eat uh, shrubs and tree leaves. But bison are found more in the valleys. So when the elk moved away from the valleys, there was more food for the bison. So bison populations increased. The wolves killed coyotes, so that decreased coyote population. And coyotes feed on rabbits and mice a lot. So with the decrease in coyote populations, there was an increase in the population of rabbits and mice. So what we see is that the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone National Park brought back balance to the whole park. And this is called a trophic cascade when you have one species affecting all species across the landscape. For example, we have this effect of wolves on beavers. How is the effect, how does this effect happen? Because the wolves reduce elk populations, the reduction in elk leads to an increase in trees like willow and aspen which the beavers like to eat. So that increases beaver populations. It doesn't quite stop there with the increase in beavers, 
we have more dams along the rivers and more pools, which leads to an increase in uh, fish and frogs and um, amphibians and an increase in river otters, which like these pools and like to eat the fish in these pools. So these kinds of effects across all trophic levels is called a trophic cascade. Another example is of trophic cascades is how the wolves affected the bears. Again, the wolves reduced the elk populations, which led to an increase in shrubs growing along the rivers. A lot of these shrubs uh, bear berries, which the bears like to eat. So that led to an increase in bear populations. So effects across trophic levels because of top predators is called a trophic cascade. So here are some data. So the wolves had been absent in Yellowstone National Park since the early 1900s, which led to a dramatic decline in a lot of other species in the park. The wolves were brought back in 1995 and 96, and there was a steady recovery of diversity. Let's see what happened. So between 1900 to 2010, the data show that we see a sl increase in wolves between 1990 because the increase started in 95, 96, and then there's been a steady increase except for one year, there was a little bit of a dip. But there's been some increases and decreases over time, but they've definitely increased from a zero population. That has brought down the population of elk significantly. Because elk like to browse, browse means eating of leaves, because of the decrease in elk populations, we see a decrease in the browsing of trees and shrubs, particularly in the riparian regions, which is the regions along the rivers. So we see that particularly along the rivers, there is an almost zero browsing level. With that, we see an increase in tree species, aspen, willow, cottonwood. And with the aspen, we see a particular increase in the riparian region, which is near the rivers. Consequently, we see an increase in beaver populations and an increase in bison populations. So we can see how the reintroduction of wolves has led to a cascading effect across all trophic levels. So the wolves in the Yellowstone National Park can be considered a keystone species. A keystone species is any species that has a dramatic effect on its ecosystem and its ecological community. And this effect is disproportionate to its abundance. What does that mean? It means that usually the keystone species is found in low abundance, but its effect on the ecosystem and community is very large. So its effect is disproportionate to its abundance. Only then can you call it a keystone species. Something that is in high abundance and has a large effect on its ecosystem and community cannot be considered a keystone species because its effect is uh, not disproportionate to its abundance. If a species is in high abundance and has a large effect on the ecosystem, then its effect is proportionate to its abundance. And that's a different uh, kind of species. We'll talk about that later. The keystone species has an effect that is disproportionate to its abundance. Predators in ecosystems. And they have this effect on the ecosystem mainly because of uh, how they impact the intermediate trophic level or rather the primary consumers because these keystone species, which are top predators, predate all upon or kill the primary consumers. And that then affects the rest of the community and ecosystem. <clears throat> Let's shift gears now and talk about how life 
started on the planet and let's talk about early life forms on the planet. We believe that the first life forms on the planet were extremophiles. Extremophiles are species that can live in extreme environments and most of these are bacteria and archaea. Lots of bacteria and archaea can live in very extreme environments such as uh, salt marshes, so very saline environments, hydrothermal vents deep down in the oceans where it's very hot with these uh, vents that are releasing hot gases into the ocean and lots of strong chemicals, uh, regions where there is a lot of acid flowing in the uh, waters because of um, mining and other activities, places where there are a lot of volcanoes. These are all extreme environments and bacteria, there are some bacteria and archaea that are extremophiles. We believe that the earliest life forms on earth were bacteria that were extremophiles. We think that these prokaryotes, remember bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes and the first life forms were bacteria. So these were prokaryotes that were extremophiles and most likely we believe that life evolved in the hydrothermal vents in the benthic zone of the ocean. What, is, what do all these big words mean? Let's see. So the benthic zone is the deep ocean floor where it's very, very deep. A hydrothermal vent is places in the benthic zone where gases escape from the earth under high heat and pressure. Now in the benthic zone, there, there are a lot of nutrients because of decomposing dead organism which, uh, organisms which fall down to the bottom of the ocean floor. So this here is supposed to be a hydrothermal vent, but no light penetrates here. Now in most ecosystems, the producers are photosynthetic organisms which rely on sunlight and nutrients to make their own food. What are the primary producers in the benthic zone of the ocean? Here because there is no light, the benthic zone of the ocean has chemosynthetic bacteria and archaea which use hydrogen sulphide from hydrothermal vents and with this energy from breaking down hydrogen sulphide, they are able to convert carbon, inorganic carbon into organic carbon, mainly glucose. Chemosynthesis is the, oh, is the process by which organisms use energy from chemicals to make their own food. And then all of the other organisms in the benthic zone depend on them for food. So we're going to watch a quick movie about these uh, chemosynthetic prokaryotes at the bottom of the ocean. Just a few decades ago, submersibles and remote sensing technologies allowed scientists to visit the farthest reaches of the ocean for the very first time. Of the many wonders they discovered, one of the most surprising was the existence of rich clusters of life flourishing in the darkness of the deep sea floor. The inner workings of these ecosystems have proved to be as unusual as their location, for they are powered not by the light of the sun, but by the heat of the earth. At the heart of these deep sea communities is a process called chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is the use of energy released by inorganic chemical reactions to produce food. It is analogous to the more familiar process of photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants grow in sunlight capturing solar energy to make organic matter. In chemosynthesis, bacteria grow in mineral-rich water, harnessing chemical energy to make organic material. 
chemosynthesis can sustain life in absolute darkness. The most extensive ecosystem based on chemosynthesis lives around undersea hot springs. At these hydrothermal vents, a chemical-rich soup bubbles out of the crust and into the bottom of the sea. Boiling hot, saturated with toxic chemicals and heavy metals, and more acidic than vinegar, vent waters are deadly to most marine animals. This noxious brew is paradise to the bacteria that coat the rocks around the vent in thick orange and white mats. The bacteria absorb hydrogen sulfide streaming from the vents and oxidize it into sulfur. They use the chemical energy released during oxidation to combine carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen into sugar molecules. From this simple reaction, an entire ecosystem grows. Snails, clams, mussels, and a host of other grazing animals feed on the bacterial mats. Crabs and shrimp eat the grazers and then are hunted by larger crabs, fish, and octopi. The largest and most abundant vent creatures are tube worms and giant white clams, animals that thrive because they have developed a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship with the bacteria. Bacteria live within the hard-shelled animals where they are protected from predators. The tube worms and clams receive a built-in food supply because they absorb nutrients directly from the bacteria. Tube worms, the signature inhabitants of hydrothermal vents, are absolutely dependent on their internal bacteria. As adults, they have no mouth or digestive system, no means of getting food apart from their symbionts. Their blood-rich tissues, colored red by hemoglobin, absorb dissolved gases from the vent water and from the seawater, and then carry them to the bacteria. The bacteria convert the chemicals to organic matter and share the excess with the tube worms. This extraordinary relationship is highly satisfactory to both species. Millions of bacteria live safely within each tube worm. The tube worms in return are so well nourished that they are the fastest growing invertebrates on Earth, stretching up to two meters long in a single year. Despite the total darkness, crushing water pressure, and temperatures that swing from above boiling to near freezing, life is good at hydrothermal vents, thanks to chemosynthetic bacteria. Vent faunas have both large biomass and high diversity. Over 300 species of animals have been found at vents, most living nowhere else on the planet. But life based on chemosynthesis is also precarious. The hydrothermal vents, the source of life-sustaining chemicals, can be extinguished at any time by earthquakes, lava flows, or rock falls. This video shows the seafloor near a vent, once covered by a dense field of tube worms. Then, a year later, home only to bare rock, after lava buried the worms. Many vents close after a few months or years, and few seem to survive more than a couple of decades. Once the supply of chemicals stops, the bacteria die, and the rest of the fauna must either migrate or perish. Chemosynthetic communities are also found in marine settings other than hydrothermal vents. At so-called cold seeps, where tectonic activity squeezes mineral water out of the ground and around sea bottom petroleum deposits. Methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide are released. Bacteria use these compounds to make organic molecules which support a web of symbionts, carnivores, and scavengers.
So that video helped us understand how life must have first evolved from in these hydrothermal vents and life continues to exist at these hydrothermal vents in the benthic zone. So next in class, we are going to learn all about prokaryotes and eukaryotes and the differences between them.